So some people don't like it when you call uh, this morning Easter morning uh, because that's, you know, pagan. Uh, I don't think if you mean it as a celebration of Christ's resurrection that it's going to harm anything, but I understand. And so it is resurrection morning in the classic sense, and uh, it's a delight to just freshly meditate upon the empty tomb. And so this is just a very unique way of doing that. And I I don't remember the last time I brought up this story, but it's the story of Jonah uh, in regards to the resurrection. It's like, what a a weird uh, connection that is. It's not a weird connection. Jesus himself actually makes the connection, but it does feel a little weird. In fact, if you've ever read the book of Jonah and you're honest, it's a very strange book. And, uh, you know, you can't always be honest about those things. Like, praise God for the word of God. This is true. Uh, however, it, it's the weirdest ending to a book, I think, in the entire Bible. It literally just says how many people uh, are potentially in Nineveh and then, you know, and how much livestock there is. And then it just sort of ends. It's like, uh, well, well, how did this turn out? We don't, we don't know. It just ends. And it's, it's really odd in that regard. But it all is purposeful. Everything that God does in Scripture is very, very purposeful. And it's almost like there's an ellipsis at the end, which is then fulfilled by Jesus Christ. It's it's truly remarkable and profound. This is called the sign of the man. And uh, that should trigger some thoughts in you where I'm going with this, because uh, Jesus is going to use a term just like that, and... Uh, there is something known as the sign of Jonah, and I'm going to build on that today by showing you the sign of Jesus, because it's the same sign. So we're going to go back in time and and talk about the city called Nineveh, and uh, what Nineveh means, if any of you remember the story of Jonah, he was called to Nineveh to preach uh, repentance, and he didn't really want to go, so he got on a ship and headed the wrong direction. But Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, which at the time had basically just devoured the earth and taken over the earth. And they were a very, very ruthless, warlike people. And for all practical purposes, the Israelites didn't just not like them, but they hated them to the point that it would be the worst thing imaginable to see God show mercy to them. So to preach to them, you could sort of get inside of Jonah's shoes and say, you know what, I really don't want God to be merciful to them. So no thank you. I mean, there's a lot of dynamic in this story that isn't just in the text. You have to sort of know even contextually what is taking place and why Jonah would be so eager to go in a different direction. But the, uh, the city itself, Nineveh, actually translates as the house of the fish, or another way of saying it is, fish within the house. It's like, huh, that's odd. Now, again, I'm giving something away even by sharing that because I'm going to be building on what's called the sign of Jonah, okay? And I'm going to give an educated guess of what I would declare that to be. But think about what their capital city is. This is a massive city in the ancient world. Took three days to pass through it. It was called the city of the, uh, the city of three days journey. It's like, what, three days to pass through a city? I mean, what How big was this thing? We're not exactly sure. All we know is at the very end of Jonah, it says that there were 120,000 people that didn't know their right hand from their left hand in this city. Does that mean that's all that were in the city? What if there's just 120,000 that just don't know their right hand from their left hand, which could have meant children. Okay, so we don't know. We just know it was a massive city in history and three days to pass through it. Wow, that's a lot. And, but this meaning has to do with a fish. Now, what's interesting is a fish has a lot to do with the story, too. And so let's, let's progress. I'm trying to give hints at the same time I'm progressing. Nineveh, the capital city of the ancient Assyrian Empire, termed by the prophet Nahum to be the bloody city, and it was also said to be the city of three days' journey, a city located on the eastern shores of the mighty Tigris River, and a city whose very name indicates the idea of a fish in control of the house. Okay, so they're off this river, and, uh, and I'm going to give at least a theory. Okay, I can't, can't prove this, but it's, it, it has some good substantiation to it that very likely there was a large fish that either was worshipped or was feared, was dreaded. I don't know if you think of like one of those megalodon types of fishes. It's a little better than our whale. 
uh, you know, idea that we have, because it was called a great fish. It wasn't called a whale. It was a great fish. We don't know what that is. However, the entire city seems to be named, in a sense, to say we are under the dominion of it. Isn't that fascinating? It's like a city that either is worshiping that or is showing reverence to it or is showing great fear and trepidation towards it. It's like a deference uh, to it. The Ninevites, controlled by the lusts of the flesh. So that's a great way of describing the Ninevites. They, Ishtar was the one they worshipped, and uh, it's, she was known as the goddess of war and sensual indulgence and was the object of their worship. And so you, when I say that they were controlled by their flesh, that's a pretty accurate way of describing the Ninevites. Pretty, good ac pretty accurate way of describing anyone outside of Jesus Christ, isn't it? <clears throat> So this is the basis of the greatest revival recorded in the entire Bible. Uh, a minimum of 120,000 wicked men and women repented in the house of the fish. So we don't know how many people there were. We just know the entire city basically turned to God and repented. It's a very dramatic story, but there is nothing to compare it with in all of Scripture as far as the grandeur and the size of the, of the revival. It's weird because the greatest revival came out of an unwilling messenger. Isn't that fascinating to just sort of think through? It's like this was God desiring to bring revival and repentance to this people, which is an incredible statement of the entire Bible. That the, the Jews, you know, they, they look at themselves as God's chosen people, and rightfully so. However, they struggle with the fact that they also could be after the Gentiles. And because the Gentiles are like this, this is what they're like. And so in the story, ironically, we're far more like Nineveh and the Ninevites than we are like the Jews in the story. Now, I'm not saying that some of you aren't, you know, pure-blooded Jews in here, but it's, it's actually good for us to recognize that God has mercy towards us and has pursued us. So how did this all happen, this grand revival? How is it that men and women without even a desire for God would turn with such radical abandon towards him. Something is going to happen that is going to cause this people group that has no interest in God to suddenly radically turn. I mean, desperately turn, where they literally are calling a fast, putting sackcloth, not just on themselves, but on their cattle. And they are, uh, I mean, they're, in abs they're not even allowing their cattle to drink and eat. It's like everything fast. It's like the whole town, the whole town, the whole city, the whole community just shuts down, lest the judgment of God come upon them. Wow, we could do with a little of that type of intensity. The Bible says that they were given a sign. And so remember, I'm calling this message the sign of the man. And in hindsight, we're going to see in the New Testament that they were given something known as the sign of Jonah. That, it doesn't actually say that. And you read through the book of Jonah, it doesn't say, oh, and here's where they were given a sign. All we know is that Jonah spat up on the beach, and then he enters into his first day of the three-day journey across the city preaching, and people start heeding and hearing. And even the king gets the message, and the king is like, oh, we must do something. What, what accompanied this? That is the strangest thing. I mean, I've preached for years, and I don't have that type of impact. What was also associated with this? He said it was a sign. So here in Matthew 12, 39 through 41, but he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there shall be no sign be, no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, the whale is a, a controversial translation there, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented of the preaching of Jonah and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Strangely, the sign was a man. That's the sign. It was, it was a man that was a sign. Listen to this scripture. Luke eleven twenty nine 29 through 30. As Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites, so also shall the son of man be to this generation. So it's just fascinating to think that a man is a sign. Now, what was special about Jonah that would be such a signal, such a calling to repentance of an entire people group? And as Jonah was assigned to Nineveh, so Jesus is a sign. What was the sign of Jonah unto the Ninevites? Now, 
I wish I could make this like a, a statement of fact. It makes your preaching a lot easier when you can do that. But it's always good in preaching to recognize where it's fact and where it's speculation. And I'm going to go into a little territory of speculation, but it's, hey, it's reasonable. So I'm going to call it a guess, okay, even though it's an educated guess. I should have put educated uh, up, on, up on the screen. An educated guess, the sign of Jonah. What is the sign of Jonah? Now, I want you to imagine a community or a, a, a city, an entire empire that is under the thumb, whether it's fear or of deference and worship, whether they think this fish has supernatural powers. I don't know what was going on in their mind but where they are controlled by it. And it has the upper hand, if you will, or the upper fin uh, in their life. And as a result, imagine that when Jonah is spat back up, that imagine that that fish no longer just goes off and swims away, but imagine that it lies there with its jaws open. And Jonah, in a sense, strolls out. Jonah seems to have demonstrated something, and that is power over that which controlled them. And as a result, when he starts speaking, he is one who has defeated the fish. And so when he begins to speak, now other people have said that after all the gastric juices inside of the, the ship's belly might have turned him white. Okay, that would have been a little weird for them as well. Maybe that's part of it, right? Uh, he's the transfigured prophet uh, before them. However, I'm guessing it has something to do with the fish. So imagine the messengers run throughout the city yelling this. That great fish that controls us doesn't control him. The great fish is subservient to this man. The great fish is at the command of this man's God. The great fish is under this man's, God's feet, this man's God's feet. That's an interesting way of saying it. For this man's God has proven in and through this prophet's restoration back to life from the great fish's belly that he is indeed master of the great fish. So instead of calling it Nineveh, uh, it's because you don't live in Nineveh, but there is a place you do live, Sineva. You see, this is where all of us dwell. We are in a territory... Uh, known as Sineva. Okay, yes, made up name, but it's a good way of describing it. And what would that be described as? The house of sin or sin is in the house. In other words, we may not tremble before a great megalodon fish in the Tigris River. We do tremble before the realities that something has power over us. Something other than our own will controls us, and that is known as sin. When we are in that bondage to sin, it is a very desperate thing when you begin to realize it because up to that point, you could actually say, I can stop doing this anytime I want. I don't need to do this. I can keep my eyes from looking on that. I can keep my tongue from speaking that if I really wanted to. All right, start now. Try it. You see, you don't realize that you're controlled until you try and get out. And then you begin to recognize, actually, sin controls the house. We are stuck in sin of us. And so, just like the Ninevites were controlled by something, they were controlled, and I'm saying, by a fish, or fear of a fish, or some, it's probably some supernatural dimension to this, if we turned it into a novel, it would be very intriguing, right? If we were to dig into it and maybe explore some of it, maybe there's some supernatural aspects to this. But what's interesting is the day of celebration for Ishtar, that they would have in there, you know that it's basically, the same, it measures to the same time as Easter. Ishtar, Ishtar, do you understand why people struggle with talking about calling it Easter? It's like, whoa, where does that come from? Well, you know what, some strange roots here. So think about the day in which Jesus is going to declare his power. You see, there's something about this that is rather interesting, and it's a sign of Jonah, which would have been happening at this exact time. I can almost guarantee it, that at the very time they have their high celebration of that which controls them, Suddenly, one comes out of the water declaring that he has defeated it. So, Sineva, the house of sin, sin is in the house. So, this is, in a sense, what the Old Testament is doing. It is the messengers of the law running throughout the city of destruction, which is where we live, and yelling, you are all under sin's control. 
Its wage is certain death. Your rebellion against God has issued the flesh legal right within your bodies to rule over your appetites so that you cannot do as you want to do. Darkness is your eternal destiny. The grave yawns with eager expectation to devour you and savor your soul forever. Thank you, O law. That is very encouraging to know that I am condemned unto death. You see, there is something that controls us, and that's basically what the law's job is, is to run ahead. It is a messenger that goes before, preparing the way. Repent, because you are under a just condemnation, but there is one that follows me is what the law also says. One who follows me, because the law can only bring the reality of your naked state, of your defeated state, but it's playing a role. It is an important role. It's a righteous job. John the Baptist is going to precede Jesus. He doesn't bring salvation to the people, but he can point to the one who can, and he points to Jesus Christ, just like the law will do. You see, we are under, in the land of Sinova, or in the city of Sinova, we are under control. It's not a fish, it's the flesh. Did you guys like how I played that? That's, that's good. Uh, you know, some of you aren't appreciating all the little uh, phrases that I have today, but you know, maybe if you listen back to this sermon, you'll be like, oh, that was good. The sign of Jonah. So I'm going to break this into three parts. Sort of like we know the death, the burial, and the resurrection uh, of Jesus. I'm going to show the sign of Jonah in three parts as well. The sign of Jonah, we'll we'll call this part one, the death of the man. Jonah 1, verse 4, then 11 through 12 and verse 15. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. Remember, he's running. He's trying to head to Tarshish instead of to Nineveh. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was likely to be broken. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the raging ceased from her raging. And the sea ceased from her raging. I don't know what I just said, but it sounded funny. The sign of Jesus, part one, the death of the man. So we see, now I know that many of you don't look at Jonah as dying. It's a, it's a weird thing, but we look at Jonah as just being thrown overboard and some big whale coming up and swallowing up, and then he just sort of hangs out there, has a campfire inside, and he's just like, uh, just sort of passing the three days, okay? I, I have a different perspective on that. I'm not going to try and force you to believe it, but I believe that Jonah died, and I believe that he was resurrected okay i'm just saying that's just my particular persuasion towards it i don't know that it changes anything whether you conclude that way or not but just so you know where i'm going with it part one the death of the man jesus i believe he died i don't believe he returned by the way john 3 16 for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life for god sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved The sign of Jonah, part two, the burial of the man. Jonah 1, verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. It's actually one of the most intriguing phrases that you could come across. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. There's a lot of depth in that one. You know, you you were to think about this instrument of providence that was, was also the great source of potentially fear and trepidation to the Ninevites, the very people he's going to reach, has been prepared. And it just happens to be right where it needs to be at this exact time. And just like that lamb caught in the thicket in, in Genesis chapter 22, God prepared something ahead of time. And that is precisely what Jesus is. The sign of Jesus, part two, the burial of the man. And when Joseph had taken the body, this is Matthew 27, 59 through 60, when Joseph of Arimathea had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. In a sense, that's what we see. The the great fish comes up and closes in uh, Jonah, and Jonah is now in the belly, and, you know, I it's possible that the guy just sort of survived inside of this fish for three days. And I'm not going to argue that. It's a, it's a m- meaningless argument to go into to say, he did not die, or he did die, yes, he did. I mean, I don't know that that plays into 
the ultimate outcome to know that it was three days and then he was back out on the beach and then Nineveh was saved. And that's a picture of Christ no matter how you cut it, right? However, uh, oh, this is not what I was uh, thinking was next, but Matthew 27, 61 through 66. Now, the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together into Pilate saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said while he was yet alive, after three days, I will rise again. Command, therefore, at the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, You have a watch. Go your way. Make it sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. A watch means, means a guard of soldiers. The sign of Jonah, part three, the resurrection of the man. Jonah 2, 2 through 3, 6, 9 through 10. So listen to this. This is... This is profound as far as what was going on for Jonah in this time. And said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I. And thou heard my voice, for thou hadst cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Okay, I, that's why I'm saying. It's just like, hey, you know, this is way too similar to the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. And it's hard for me to overlook the fact that there's a good argument, you know, woven into that, that, that Jonah died. And I don't think it's too fantastical to think that he died and was raised again to new life to do something and to demonstrate to the Ninevites something. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that, I, pay that that I have vowed. So this is Jonah speaking, and he is going to say, salvation is of the Lord. That's his, his grand statement. Right in this context of basically what we're going to call the resurrection, of he is going to make the declaration, salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spoke unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. That word for salvation is the same word for Jesus in the Old Testament, Yeshua. Yeshua is of the Lord, Yehovah, which is the I am, God. It's just, I'm, I'm just saying, that's an incredible statement that Jonah has this one line in the Old Testament, which is quite extraordinary. Yeshua is Yehovah. <laughs> I mean, it's just a rather profound thing for our ears to hear. It's like, Jesus is the I am. Uh, is the way we could even hear that today. And the Lord spoke unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. The sign of Jesus, part three, the resurrection of the man. He is not here, it says in Luke 24, 6 through 8, but is risen. Remember how he spoke unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Mark 16, 6, and he has said unto them, be not afraid, you seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified, he is risen, he is not here, behold the place where they laid him. You know, in both of these situations, you have this interesting request, my favorite translation is come and see where the Lord lay. It's an interesting request, it's sort of like, instead of just saying, take my word for it, it's like, see, the tomb is empty. Do you, you see this? You see the linens folded in there? And what's interesting is, to us, I don't know if it, has, it means the same thing. You know, the fact that his head linen was folded separately. You get the sense that that means something back then, you know, because it's mentioned. You know, it's like, why, is it, why are they mentioning that? However, not being of that culture, we don't always catch the meaning of seeing the empty room. I mean, just, if someone just tells us it's empty, that's good enough for me, right? But you actually see, when Peter enters in, one of the statements is, and he believed. It's just a really interesting statement. He enters into the tomb, sees the linens folded, sees that it's empty, and he believed. Uh huh. I think we need to understand a little something there. I think we need to enter into this sign, and we need to allow it to convince us afresh so that we would believe. Matthew 28, 6, He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. The good news in the streets of Sinova. Okay, now remember, you're, you're Sinova. Okay, you're in, in, inside your soul, that's the streets of Sinova. And in a sense, we have this 
sign that is given to us. That there is a messenger that is coming that is making his way through. It's a three-day journey. Isn't that an, an interesting statement? Through this territory of Sinova. And there is a message that is being brought to our soul. It's called good news. So I call this the messengers of the resurrection run throughout the city of destruction and yell, one greater than the power of sin has come. Come and see. Look where he once lay for three days. The grave sits here stunned, unable to speak, and with gaping wonder it stares in awe at its defeat, for it proved unable to hold him down. He has made a public spectacle of all the powers of darkness, for death, our great enemy, has been defeated by him. And the sin and, and, the sin and flesh that ruled this house no longer has legal right to master our lives. Why would you fear a fish? Imagine you're a Ninevite. And imagine you've always grown up with this terror over this fish. You know, maybe it even had the ability to come out of water with these little feet and grab someone from the town and bring them back into the water. It's like, ah! You know, you hear a scream in the night. It's like, oh! It's this terrible reality that you live near the Tigris River where the fish is, right? And you can imagine what terror that would bring. But imagine how well you would sleep the night that you heard that the fish was no more. Now imagine that you didn't believe that the fish was no more. Imagine that you hear that the fish is no more. Oh yeah, it's just dead on the beach, on the Tigris beach. And you're like, yeah, right. I heard a scream last night. I could have sworn that I heard a scream last night. And you continue to live in fear and the domination of this idea of a fish when in actuality that fish is defeated. You know how many people I just described on earth right now that know intellectually that sin has been defeated, that death has no more hold over us, and yet they still live as if it does? It's an irrational, illogical thing to do. And so what I want to say to you if we're in Nineveh is I want to say, hey, look, I want you to come with me out to the beaches of the Tigris. I want to show you something. You know that thing that we have always feared? Look, right there as you see the rotting carcass of it with its mouth open. And you see the footprints that come and exit from it with maybe that white goop, you know, along the way too. It's defeated. It has no more power over us. We have been delivered from the power of the fish. Now, that makes sense if we go back in time. It's like you would be an idiotic Ninevite to continue to fear something that is defeated. But you would be an idiotic Christian to continue to fear something that has been defeated. Here's a statement. I want you to chew on it. Most Christians today have more faith in the power of sin to continue to control them than they do in the power of Christ to set them free from that sin. Something is off when that is the case. And I want to say, come and see. Come and see where the Lord lay. The, the grave is opened. Its mouth is like stuck open just to prove to you that Jesus walked out. You can sort of see his footprints there. You see, he has risen. Come see the great fish stinking on the shores of the Tigris. Now, our equivalent to that, to visiting and seeing is different today than we could have been able to come like Peter and John as they're running. Isn't it funny that John says that he outran Peter? I, I have always enjoyed that little line because I could see myself putting something like that in. I, I would have added something like, and I got a point, you know, for, for beating him. But then, of course, John has to acknowledge, but he stops short of going in and Peter runs right by him and goes straight into the tomb. And which is sort of a, a classic picture of Peter, you know, a little audacious, a little presumptuous, like, hey, that's a, that's a tomb, that's Christ's tomb, you don't just go barreling in there, you don't know what's in there, right? Uh, and Peter just goes running right in there. And yet, Peter sees, and it was good, in a, in a strange sense, it's good that Peter just barreled right in there and he saw something, and he believed. We have the scriptures. We don't have the ability to go back in time to the empty tomb and to walk in. One of my favorite enunciations of what we walk through is the way it was expressed by Reese Howells. Reese Howells grew up in a Christian home, and he was just a, 
he, he looked at himself as a good guy. But he had to recognize that he, though he was a moral character, though he had done a lot of good things, that he was a sinner. He needed to recognize that he too needed to be saved. And it's this crucial time in his life where the Spirit of God is, is convicting him of his need and he is crying out for salvation. His way of saying it is, he says, I saw the cross. And I was so intrigued by that when he's like, I saw the cross. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You live a couple thousand years after the cross, but you saw it? And any of you that have ever had the same type of statement in your soul, you understand what Reese Howells is saying. I saw the cross. In other words, he sees what Christ did for him, and he recognizes the value for him. And so he's seeing it. And I would say to any of you in here, if you have not seen the cross, crave that. Ask God for that exact thing. That you would see that that death on that cross was for you. It's not just that it happened 2,000 years ago. Many of you are like, yeah, 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 true, true. It, it happened. Yes, uh, am I fine now? It's not just a mental ascent. It's not just a cognitive, cognitive conclusion. It is recognizing and apprehending that that was for you. That that work saves you. You don't just, and then the next thing he said is, I saw the empty tomb. I saw the resurrected Christ. What? How did you see that? The same way, it's the eyes of faith. It's the way that only God can convince us. The Holy Spirit is the convincer. And when we understand that he convicts, we sometimes miss the fact that conviction is a convincing of the soul of our wrongness and of his rightness. And so he convinces us. He brings about a full persuasion, a full assurance. And if you, don't, if you have not seen the empty tomb, if you have not seen that that stone is rolled away and that he is victorious, crave that. Come to God and say, Lord, I don't want to rest until I see that. And then his other statement was, I saw the glorified Christ. You see, not with his own two eyes, but he saw it. And I could say the same thing. I have seen the cross. I have seen the empty tomb and I've seen the glorified Christ. I've seen the outpoured spirit. I've seen that he is coming in the clouds again even though it hasn't even happened yet. I can see it with faith. I know it's going to happen. It's a confidence. It's a strength of my soul as a result. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. Hosea 13, 14. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 56. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's how I'm finishing. The sign of the man. It's a sign. I mean, Jonah, it was his life, his very life, somehow declared something to the people of Nineveh. Jesus, his very life, his very life lived, his very life given, and his very life revived and resurrected is a testimony to us. He is who he says he is. Listen to him. His message is truth. He is, in fact, the Son of God, proven through his resurrection. Everything he has told us I believe. And that's precisely the same movement in each of our souls afresh that we believe. We don't believe in the fish in the tigress or the flesh in our life that maybe even was ruling us last night. We believe in the authority and the power of our conquering Savior who has defeated death, who has defeated sin, who has defeated the flesh so that we could be free to live for him. So listen to this line. He will prove, and this is what the sign of the man is, he will prove to master that which masters everyone else. The grave masters everyone else. Sin masters everyone else. What does Jesus prove? He masters it. He is master over sin. He is sinless. He is master over the flesh. He was not controlled by the flesh. He was controlled by the spirit. And he mastered the grave. He mastered death. He conquered it. It is under him. 
And that is a sign and a signal to each of our souls. He is who he says he is. And there's, it even gets more exciting when we recognize that he has saved us so that we too could share in his mastery over those things. He didn't just master them and say, ha, you know, and then brush off the dust and say, see, that's how it's done. And then we're like, wow, how do I whip this up? He says, I know that you can't do it, which is why I did it for you. I always liken it to a door, like in his side. I, I picture this side, you know, opened up with a spirit that is like a doorway. And he says, I want you to climb on in. And when by faith we climb into his work on the cross, we share in it. And his death becomes our death. And now our flesh, our old life is nullified. It no longer controls us. And his burial is our burial. And now our old life is discarded and out of view. And then when he resurrects, we resurrect in his resurrection. And now we have new life in Christ Jesus. And then when he ascends, we go with him. And as in Ephesians, it says, we are seated with him in heavenly places in Christ. So this is our cherished truth that we have not just witnessed that he did something, but that he did it for us to share it with us. Father, Thank you for the gift of Jesus, and thank you for that amazing empty tomb. And Lord, I pray that we would all see it, that we would see the cross, that we would see the resurrected Christ, that we would see the glorified Christ afresh today, if not for the very first time. Lord, these are spiritual sights. This is not something that we can muster. This is something that you gift us. So Lord, we ask for that. We crave that. We desire to know you and to believe. We don't want to be firm believers in the power of sin. We want to be firm believers in the power that you have over sin. Lord, we love you. Happy Resurrection Day. It's in the precious name of Jesus that we declare this.